We are in the book of Romans chapter 3, uh, and we are looking at verses uh, 10 through 18. And I want to introduce you to uh, just the concept uh, uh, to help you understand this passage. Uh, the concept is the, the Queen Mary ship. When it came to Los Angeles uh, in 1967, they decommissioned it. It had served as an ocean-going vessel, uh, making 1,001 crossings across the Atlantic uh, from 1936 through 1967. Uh, and it, it, it had actually carried, in World War II, they commissioned it as a troop, troop carrier. Uh, it had carried almost 800,000 soldiers to battle in the European theater. So, amazing ship. Uh, and I went to college in Los Angeles, and I was... Uh, in college in 1976, 10 years after they brought it there. It was an amazing ship. But what is really interesting, I've told you before and I'll tell you again, uh, you can find illustrations in a whole lot of things if you just pay attention. Uh, and this illustration from this ship is an amazing thing about the condition of man's soul. Uh, when you look at this ship, when they brought it to L.A. Harbor, uh, they wanted to surface, surface, uh, surface it. So they took the smokestacks off and uh, set them by crane uh, uh, on the docks to begin to work on them. And what they realized is... This ship had been painted 30 times in its lifetime. How many people are in the Navy here? I know we have some of them. One Navy individual. Okay, I guess you're surrounded by a sea of Marines and Army and everybody, Air Force and everybody else. We'll pray for you. <laughs> yeah. If you don't paint a ship, what happens? It rusts. So they painted it 30 times. When they set the, the giant smokestacks down on the, on the dock, uh, to, to figure out what to do with the steel to you know, bring it up to snuff for tourism, uh, they be, it began immediately to disintegrate into dust. It was held together by one thing, paint. <laughs> kind of like your car in D.C., isn't it? It's all rusted. It's just the paint. Uh, paint held it together. Uh, and so they figured out they had a huge problem in their hands uh, because they only had smokestacks made, made of paint. Uh, they, they had been compromised. When I read that story and understood Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 18, there's a one-to-one -one correlation because that is the condition of a man that doesn't know, go, know, know God. Externally, he might look fine. He have sailed the seas. I've seen life. I've done well. And my smokestacks are great. They're painted with my own version of righteousness, my works. How wonderful it is. But you set them down on the dock and you find out through the engineers, there's an internal problem called sin. It's a corrosive. And Paul is talking to the Jews of his day by way of review. Uh, he's spent the first chapter of Romans talking to the Gentile world, how they are lost and in need of a Savior. Uh, and in chapter 2, he begins talking to the Jews who believe that they're saved based on, well, pedigree, heritage, love of the Torah, uh, observance of, uh, of uh, special days like Rosh Hashanah, Hanukkah, etc., all the works things. And he says, no, that's, that's more like, a, to use our metaphor, you're just painting the smokestack, but inside is corruption. Now, one thing I learned before we get to my sermon, it, sometimes it takes me a few minutes to get to the sermon. You realize this, do you not? Yeah. Or you forgot. Uh, when, you, when, you, uh, when you look at this particular passage, uh, Paul is, is, is getting down to the point that I used to be like this. I used to think I was saved by all these external works. When I was um, uh, reading about millennials and then started reading about Generation X, or Generation Z, one, there's, all, there's pros and cons that you see woven through them uh, as young people. Um, there's much to work with there. There's many points of concern. Um, but one of the things that I, that I noticed as I read that was a common thread through all the, the books I was reading uh, was they, both of them, the, the young teenagers uh, up through the, the, the millennials today, they collectively uh, do not want to go to church because they find it, in their words, it's so negative. It's a negative. Now, in my day and age, back in the 60s, it would have been a downer. Remember that Greek word? It's a downer, man. You know, I mean, so, you know, or a bummer, whatever. I mean, those, those words have morphed into other ones, but it's just negative. Uh, and so when you read chapter uh, 3, verses uh, 10 through uh, 18 here, I, I'm going to tell you it's not positive. I mean, Paul is highly negative. I'm just telling you up front, if you're a millennial or Generation Z, I'm fulfilling your dreams today. This is negative. Now, here's the thing. Why is it negative? Paul's going to say, you cannot get into heaven unless you understand your condition. You're, you're, you are compromised. Externally, you might feel okay. Internally, you have a sin problem. So you, you, Paul is real. I don't know about you. I would rather have him be real with me so I can know my spiritual condition, so I can find the Savior, than to be deluded by false thinking. So Paul is going to be negative here. So if you're looking for a positive sermon, that's not today. 
I mean, I'll throw some positive things in, but Paul's getting real here. What's his question? He's going to answer a simple question in these verses. Why do all people, Jew and Gentile, need the Savior? Because they all do. So in verse 9, by way of review, he talked about, as an attorney would in a court of law, he calls all men into God's courtroom, and he says in verse 9, all are under sin, none excluded, verse 9. Then that's the charge he brings in the courtroom. In uh, verses 10 through 18, he moves from the charge to what he calls the contamination, the evidence. I've made the charge, all are under sin. Now let me present to you the evidence that man is contaminated, that he's corroded on the interior of his being no matter what he does. This is what we're going to look at, the contamination of man. He's born contaminated. Again, I've told you, I'll tell you again, review is a wonderful thing. If you do not believe man is born corroded, have a child. Why? Because you never teach them how to sin, right? They just come like that. They come like that. I watched a guy yesterday at the airport with a little kid. I observe people. I profile. I'm sorry. I do. I'm, I'm, I'm watching. And that poor father was tuckered out by the time he got on that plane with two little children fighting each other, constantly, bam, fighting, 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 fighting. I'm thinking, you can stop this. I want to help him, but I'm, a, I'm just a passenger on the plane. I mean, I'm thinking there's an illustration of innate sin right there. Those two little kids duking it out, fighting it out. I'm sure he never gave a lesson on that. Man's contaminated. He's contaminated in three ways. His character, verses 10 through 12. His conversation is corroded, 13 to 14. And his conduct is contaminated, verses 15 to 17. This is a man that doesn't know God. All of those areas about him will eventually show his corrosion. His character, verses 10 to 12, his conversation eventually will show he doesn't know and walk with God, and then his conduct will definitely show he doesn't walk with God. Let's look at them in that order. But before we look at that, those three things of why man needs to be saved, I want to do a little grammatical analysis, because what would a sermon be without grammar? I'm just saying. You sound totally excited. So bear with me, okay? That's what it looks like in Greek, Okay. Okay, so why are we looking at that? I mean, maybe this is your first study and you're like, oh man, I just want lunch. What in the world? No, this is cool. Why is this cool? <laughs> I'll try to help you. Uh, it's the inspired word of God. And they spoke in Greek and they translated it into English. So the word order is so important. So just analyze this for me with, with me for just a minute. Paul's going to say here, just, kathos is the word just as, uh, gagrapatai is a perfect tense, just as it is written, uh, uh, there is uk esti. There is none. Then he says uh, dikaios. There is none righteous. Now, I was reading that in my Greek text, and I started no noticing the word uk, no, the uh, word. So I started highlighting it in yellow, you know, as I'm reading it. Um, but there's a whole lot more. There's one there. There's one there. It, it's all over the place. Paul keeps saying no, no, no. What is a millennial thinking? Negative. So negative. What's Paul's problem? He's trying to wake you up. Here's the bad news. You, you're corroded, spiritually speaking. The good news is, verses 19 and following, Jesus is the solution to your corrosion. He's the only solution. So he's telling you no, no, no all over the place, and it's totally emphatic in the Greek text because it appears all over the place. And he doesn't get down, he doesn't even take a breath, basically, until you get down here to verse 17 where he throws in this word chi. Chi is the word and. He only uses and one time. Usually when you're talking and telling somebody something that's emotionally driven, you use and a lot, and this and that and this and that, etc. Paul has one giant breath, goes through all these negative things. He doesn't get down to and until verse 17. What's this? This is called in, in figure of speech, ascendaton. Polyascendaton is the use of many ands. This is asyndaton, alpha privative. A wedded to syndaton means, well, virtually no ands. What's that mean? He wants you to move quickly over what he's talking about to get to the main thing. What's the main thing? Jesus is the Savior and solution to your problem. All right? Because this is a sermon, we can't move quickly. <laughs> Sorry. We're going to move slowly through what Paul said to make sure you understand what he says here. Very important. Verse 11, what does he say? Well, what does he say? What does he say in verse 11? There is none who want understands. There is none who understands. Understands. Sinion is the Greek word. It's a present tense part of simple meaning. The person who doesn't know and walk with God is in, a, in a, is a present state of not getting the things of God. He looks to the things of Christianity like, what are you talking about? I mean, why would you want to go to sermon and listen to a guy preach for 30 minutes? 
I mean, that is, sounds boring to me. I mean, they just, they just don't get it. You try to explain spiritual things to them, and it just does, you can just tell it just does not register. What's the problem? Sin is the problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, what did Paul say? But a natural man, code word for a non-Christian, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. And then see that next word, for? That's the word gar in Greek. He's going to tell you the reason why they don't accept the things of God. Because when he looks at the things of God, what's he think about them? That's foolishness, man. Why would I want to believe in that? What's the proof of that? No. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual, i.e. the Christian, appraises all things, spiritually speaking. Yet he himself is appraised by no man, meaning your friends can't figure you out that don't walk with God. For, he has no, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we as Christians have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. There is no man who what? understands. Well, does that mean that a, that a non-Christian can't understand a whole lot of things I explained to him about biblical things? No, he can cognitively get them. But what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when it says the natural man does not accept them, I was assigned this as a Greek exegetical paper my sixth year of Greek. And they arbitrarily hand out the passages. You can't pick an easy one for an easy paper. They gave me this one, and I'm like, oh, great. It was awesome. I found out readily as I did all my work on this passage that it doesn't mean he can't get them. He gets them and throws them to the wayside as utter foolishness. He embraces that concept you just told him, but like, no way am I serving Jesus. Boom, throws it away. He gets it, but he doesn't want to embrace it. Is that a picture of your life? You understand what the Christian point is, but you're not going to have any part of that. Uh, yesterday, I had a driver uh, bringing me home from the airport. Never met him before. Picks me up at the airport. Me and Liz, we're tired. We've been traveling all day. You know, we want to get home, go to bed. Uh, but it's 8 o'clock, but we're on jet lag. You know the, you know the drill. Uh, and and it was right, we were no sooner left the airport, and we we're just talking. And, and he, he eventually asked me, uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, pastor a church. Oh, Really? That's fantastic. Uh, and so then come the questions. My dad's a Muslim. My mom's a Methodist. Really? And they're married? <laughs> yeah, he said they've been married for over 50 years. And I said, well, what's the deal? He goes, each one's waiting for the other one to convert. <laughs> and so we had a wonderful conversation in the car because he asked me, I've never made a decision for Allah or for Jesus. He said, I've never made a decision because I never believed that I had enough evidence to go either way. So I'm in the middle. And I told him, this is a question you need to find the answer to because there is absolute spiritual truth. You see what I'm saying? Seeking God? Yeah, he knows about Jesus. He said, I observed all the Christian uh, holidays. I also observed all the Islamic holidays. I observed both of them but I'm not convinced of either of them. So here's a person who doesn't understand the things of God. He gets them to a point, but he rejects them outright. Um, parked in my driveway yesterday uh, evening for quite a while. I told him, you might as well just turn the car off. You know? <laughs> uh, my, my, wife went, my wife went in the house and uh, you know, started unpacking the suitcases and everything. Uh, and we had, a, we had an excellent conversation. And he said, what's, what's the difference between Allah and Jesus? They're, they're the same, are they not? Oh, no, my friend, they are radically different. How so? Well, let me explain the ways. I mean, this has got nothing to do with my sermon. This is extra, but we had, an, <laughs> but we had an excellent conversation. Here's a man who knows spiritual truth, but he's rejected it outright his whole life. And so I began to explain to him the differences between Allah and Jesus. And then he wants to know what's the difference between the Islamic God and, and the Christian God. Oh, much. Explain Trinitarian to, to me, Tr Trinitarianism to me, church. Sure. I mean, it was interesting. I told him before I left, I said, the greatest thing you can do as a man who's never made a decision is pray this one prayer to God. Ask God, when you leave this place, show me who you are. And I get chills even telling you. About 11 o'clock last night when I was really groggy and half asleep, my phone sitting next to my bed charging. And you know how they go off and wake you up? Yeah. Bing, bing, the lights flashing and everything. I'm like, oh, it must be a text. So I don't have any glasses on. I'm legally blind with them off. I grab the <laughs> phone, you know, looking at the phone. Uh, and uh, he, he sent me a message. 
He, he said, after my last ride, I prayed that prayer. So I, with blind eyes, typed out to him. I hope it read correctly. I typed out to him. I had typed out to him, this is exciting because the good shepherd shall find you. You know, exciting prayer. So anyway, back to my sermon. Natural man doesn't accept things of God. He understands them, but he rejects them outright. Uh, but here, here is an individual who's understanding that, well, there's more than meets the eye once I got the evidence. Um, in John chapter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, uh, it says, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us as Christians understanding in order that we might know him who is true. We are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. I mean, it's like once you come to know God, then you really understand the things of God, and it's exciting to understand the things of God because you have the answers. You have answers. He told me something interesting, and I've heard this from other people in other uh, non-biblical faiths. He told me, he said, I am exhausted trying to please Allah. Uh, exhausted. Because I can't do enough. And I said, that's an interesting word. I said, in the entire time I followed Jesus, I have never been exhausted because his work was enough to save me. Interesting. Interesting. It says there's no one who seeks for God. There's no one who seeks God. It doesn't come naturally to them. They, they don't really want to get into it because they're afraid of probably what they might find. Um, how does a person who's contaminated like that, corroded like that, find God? Uh, Jesus says how they find God, John 16, verse 8. It says in verse 8, and when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, what's he going to do? He's going to convict the world concerning what? Sin and righteousness and judgment. He's going to convict them of their false system of morality, their false system of righteousness, what they think is righteous is not his level of righteousness. He's going to convict them all that. When I was not a Christian and I was under the conviction of the Spirit, I went to my parents, uh, the, to the pastor of our church who was a, um, a Navy captain. He was a um, chaplain. Uh, and he did, you know, so many uh, tours and things on the weekends and stuff, but he pastored our church. And I, I went to Dr. Lynn, and I said, Dr. Lynn, uh, I, 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 here's how I'm feeling as a person as I sit in your church. I was convicted. And he looked at me, and he said, he put his big old arm around me, and he leaned down to me, and he said, Marty, you're under the conviction of the Spirit of God. And I'm like, well, can't he turn me loose? <laughs> you know? I mean, I can't even sleep at night. I mean, anyway, that led to salvation. Why? The bad news led to the good news, which is I needed Christ. See, he sent the Spirit. John chapter 6, verse 44, Jesus says, No man can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is what God does to the person who doesn't want him. He then begins to draw you to himself, and you have a decision to make, which is I told the gentleman last night. You have a decision to make based on the evidence of who Jesus is. You have a decision to make. Verse 12 says, uh, all have turned aside. Together they've become useless in their character. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Why? Because they're internally corrupted. So they're, they're, even their best efforts are tainted by bad motivations. He says, they've all turned aside. The Greek word is to radically turn aside. When I look at my culture, I can safely say after walking the planet for 60 years and studying my country, I've watched them radically turn from godly things to insane things they call godly or holy, or spiritual. Radical turning. It's an intense, it's an intense word. They do it by nature. Uh, remember last summer what I was doing all summer here for my doctorate? <laughs> last summer, I did my doctoral dissertation, the 400-page dissertation on transgenderism. Then I did the 12, I did the six sermons on transgenderism. Then I did the six hour and a half lessons on Friday nights on transgenderism. And we went through Aristotelian logic and medical evidence. I mean, we went through it with a fine-tooth comb. And so we uploaded all that to, uh, to Vimeo. And so people wanted to watch the series to understand how to think about it as a Christian, to reach people that are in that situation for, for Christ, because God loves them too, does he not? And so they had a password. You get on, you can watch the series. I, a friend of mine in California asked me for the, the password. I gave it to him a couple weeks ago. He, like a day later, called me back and said, it doesn't work. So I, I talked to Ben. He did a little research and found out Vimeo barred me. That's what I said. What? <laughs> they barred me. Why? Hate speech. Hey, isn't that sad? Is that not sad? You can put any kind of perversion or whatever you want on there, and that's okay. You just put somebody on there who reasons logically, shows evidence. Is this a good li level of life or not? And that person is what? 
Oh, they're hateful. They're guilty of microaggressions. No, just teaching truth in a loving, compassionate way. They don't want to hear it. That's the culture. They radically turn aside from truth and call those who pursue truth, well, you're the radical, etc. I don't know. When I chose to follow Jesus, uh, he called me and he called you to pick up a what? A cross. And he said, if they hate me, guess what? They're going to hate you because you stand for that which is true. You're telling them that which is true. He says, there is none who uh, are around that don't turn aside from God. They've all become useless. Uh, when I was working for a Dallas, uh, at Dallas Seminary as a student, I worked for Allied Band Lines Commercial Division. On the weekends, I did uh, major commercial moves in most of the uh, high-rises in, in Dallas. One day, I was in a high-rise, about the 38th floor of a building, and I was on the receiving end of $25,000 credenzas for this one floor of this company. Each credenza was worth $25,000, okay? Back then, it was a ton of money. And as they came up in the freight elevator, I took them off the, the dollies and rolled them over to this window to position them so we could assemble them. As they came up, they were like nine-drawer credenzas, all right? So I'm pulling them over there against the wall, and after a while, I stopped, and I'm looking at them because they're just bare mahogany wood. Some guy in the basement's wrapping the drawers with a tape gun. <laughs> up the elevator they go. I'm looking at them going, oh my. I began to slowly pull the tape off. Guess what happened? All the veneer came off of these $25,000 cubicle units. I called the, my boss and said, whoever is in the basement with the tape gun, someone better stop him. See, this is what sin has done to us. Pre-fall, we were like the beautiful mahogany. Post-fall, we're damaged goods. Who fixes that? Only one person, Jesus. Jesus. Our character is compromised. It, it comes with the packaging. Our conversation is compromised. This is what Paul says in verse 13. He says, a person that doesn't know God, he says in verse 13, their throat's like an open grave. Stick around them long enough, and it's like death. I mean, have you ever been around somebody that everything is a double entendre? Do you know what a double entendre is? How many don't know what a double entendre is? I don't know if I should explain it to you, but uh, it's when you take talking and you make a sexual connotation out of it to get laughs from people. Now you know what I'm talking about? The double entendre. Uh, I was talking to my little four-year-old uh, grand, uh, uh, granddaughter the other day, and she said, Grandpa, I know what double entendres are. I'm like, so then I said, uh, could you give me some illustrations? Sure. And so she began to give me illustrations. Unbelievable. I mean, people, their conversation comes out. They can't even talk without. It's always twisted. Why is it always twisted? Because you're twisted. Paul says their throat is an open grave. Their tongues keep on deceiving. When I went to, they can't stop deceiving. It comes out with the packaging. When I was, went to go buy my first used car, I went to a friend of mine who was a financial advisor. Uh, uh, traveled 100,000 miles a year teaching people at banks, uh, man, money management and stuff. So I went to him and said, hey, Cameron, when I go buy my first used car, what, what's the best information I can have? He goes, it's pretty simple. When the salesman's talking to you, when his mouth is moving, he's lying. <laughs> That's what he told me. I'm like, are you serious? He goes, I'm serious. I was kind of laughing the whole time I'm talking to the salesman. I'm like, okay, is it true? Well, when I sold deep sea boats and lake boats and stuff in college for my roommate's dad that had the largest boat dealership in L.A., um, we had all these beautiful boats. And if you sold a new one, you made a ton of commission. You sold a used boat, you didn't get much money, but I was a broke college student. I started selling all the used boats. I mean, like all of them. What, how'd I do it? I told them the truth. I didn't lie to them. Now, if you buy this one, if it floats, you're lucky. But, you know, if I are you, little resin work there might work. But I was serious with them. So I had an older salesman come to me and tell me, I think I was 18 at the time. He's like, son, you know, so you, you got to stop being so honest. And just, you know, just, you know, don't tell him everything. Think I listened to him? No, because he was lying and deceiving people. It just comes with the packaging. The poison of an asp is under their lips, meaning, you know how a snake's fangs are retracted and you can't see them? And it looks like they're smiling at you? Ever met anybody like that? They seemed nice and friendly and you spilled information to them. It seemed so wonderful. Next thing you know, out come the fangs. Next thing you know, they strike you with the venom. And wow, what happened to me? It comes with the packaging. They're all like that. 
He, Paul says, their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Give them enough time, it comes out. When I was in San Diego last week, I was at my mother-in-law's house. And uh, she's a heart patient. Uh, her heart's at 16% capacity, so the doctors told her this week she probably has about six months to live. And uh, so we were there with her and all of her issues. And then my father-in-law has dementia pretty, pretty bad. So it was a very interesting week. But their gardeners, in my estimation, are taking advantage of them. Uh, and I love gardening. Uh, and I've worked on lots of gardening crews. And so the gardener showed up on Tuesday. I was there. And so I moseyed on outside to talk to the gardeners. I was their worst nightmare. I'm like, hey, you guys forgot about that over there. Oh, hey, yeah, man, we'll get to that. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, you need to get to that over there. Uh, and so I just followed him around for about an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, <laughs> I did. Um, but I didn't tell him who I was. I just, first they asked me who I was, and I, because they never seen me. And I said, well, I'm the son-in-law from D.C. Oh, okay. Uh, well, you know, they're just being their normal gardening landscape self, which I've worked with those crews before, cussing and all the things that they do. Um, closed off their mowing the lawn with a big, like, 40 liter thing of bear, etc. Um, the guy finally stopped and asked me, hey man, like, what do you do in D.C.? I'm a pastor of a church. He almost swallowed the beer can. <laughs> He's like, whoa, man, like, hey, my, my mouth, man, it's like unchecked, unhinged. I just apologize all over myself. As he's apologizing, he's cussing. <laughs> I'm like, if anybody needs God, you need God. He, does he not? He, he just can't help it. It comes out with the packaging. That's how we all are without God. No control. Lastly, Paul says their conduct is compromised, corroded. Verses 15 to 17, their feet are swift to shed blood. Boy, is it. Destruction and misery are in their paths. The path of peace, they don't even know what that means because they live to make life miserable for other people because they don't know the Prince of Peace. When I was at my last church, I worked in a, at a youth prison near our home, uh, and I worked in the felon ward, and I held church services there for years. One day, I was talking to a 15-year-old, wasn't even shaving 15-year-old, in for murder one. After the service, I asked this young man, Peter, explain to me, why would you shoot somebody point blank with a pistol? This is what he told me. I was cutting a drug deal. I had the dope. This guy asked me, are you good for the deal? I got the money. Are you good for the deal? So I shot him. For what reason? His answer, no one questions me. That was his answer at 15. I'm like, you have got to be kidding Illustration of what Paul says, feet swift to shed blood. Like the guy that walked in with the pistol this week at the Gazette and shot people, you, you, you know? Is the problem the pistol or the person? It's the person. You remove all weaponry and you still have a problem. What's it called? Sin. It's the heart. Paul says it's the world and how we come into the world. But the ultimate problem is verse 18, and I close with that. What's the ultimate problem? There is no fear of God before their eyes. They do not fear God. Because if you truly feared the living God, it would radically change how you live, how you love your wife, how you raise your children. It would radically change everything, that fear of God. I fear God, not in an ominous way, but in a respectful way, because I know I answered to him one day. You'll answer to him one day. That's what I told the man last night. You do not want to mess up on the question of where you spend eternity, correct? He agreed. What's the answer to man's problem? Who's contaminated by sin? It's Christ, the Savior. Jesus sat down with a lady at a well that had all kinds of issues. Her life was uh, compromised. Why? Because of the contagion of sin, that black India ink had been dropped on her life. She thought she was okay, but she starts talking to Jesus, and Jesus turns and says to her, everyone who drinks of the water of, from this well shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing to eternal life. He says, you can drink from that well all day long and it's not going to save you. I offer you water that washes the, the blackness of your soul clean. There's nothing better than that. How much India ink does it take to drop into a pitcher of pure water to, di to discolor it? One drop. How do you cleanse it? You start pouring in fresh water. See, Jesus is the fresh water. He's waiting to be poured into your life.
And there's a man I'm praying for, waiting for God to pour in his life. Who are you sharing the word of life with? Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you're a one who, through the inspired pen of Paul, mints no words. You give us the, the raw news that we need to understand who we are, spiritually speaking, without you. And it's not a pretty thing to see, but it's honest. And we pray for anyone in our church uh, that or online that hears these words and understands that, yes, that is me, those things you described. Might this be the day that they bow before the foot of the living Savior who reigns and ask him to reign over their lives. Might we be bold, courageous, compassionate, and loving to share the gospel of Christ, the living water with those about us. And might we seize opportunities that come our way uh, to share the words of life with those about us. In Jesus' name, amen.